Okay. Um, so this week we read about explorers. Are we with me? Yeah. Let's wrap up the conversations because I do, ha I, you know, I want you to respond, but I'll talk a little bit and I'll ask you a question. Um, last week we talked about all the crazy scientific uh, advances that had happened, um, you know, um, especially in astronomy. So the idea here, Caleb, this, um, uh, the idea that this earth is not in the center of the solar system, the idea that uh, the planets don't go in circles, they go in ellipses, the idea that other planets have moons and everybody was just, oh my gosh, what is happening to the universe? Everything is screwed up. Everything I thought I knew was wrong. And then people started sailing across the Atlantic Ocean and coming back and saying, oh, and you know what? There's big hunks of land over there with a bunch of people, totally different. They wear different clothes. They have different houses. They have different food. They have different languages. And everybody's like, what? 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 There are people on the other side of the world? How, what? So that's, what, that's the half we're going to talk about today. But I just want to express to you guys, this was enormous. People were kind of freaked out. And I told you, I think a few weeks ago, it would be a little bit like if we found out suddenly there were people on another planet, uh, people, creatures of some, you know, sentient uh, intelligent sort. It would really, we, we speculate, but we don't know. And some of us may think there might be, and some of us might think there aren't any other creatures, but we don't know, right? But if we did know, that would change everything overnight. That's what the world was like for these people. They kept getting more information that changed their world. Um, so um, you might wonder why people didn't sail around and check things out sooner. They had ships, right? But I want you to think about something here. We'll do our first, well, I don't really need the world map for this. Oh, this I so much wish I had a place to, but this one has a board on the top. It's kind of falling apart at the bottom. Um, yeah. Um, so the Mediterranean, Dude, I'm going to point to it and then you guys can go online. Um, people were sailing up and down the Mediterranean for centuries, for millennia. But are you ever very far away from land when you're in the Mediterranean? You're, you're really not. Compare that to the Atlantic Ocean and how long you would be away from land. And then compare that to the Pacific Ocean, which is on both ends, you know. You're away from land for a really, a really long time. And so it's not that they weren't good sailors. It's that for most of the ancient world, it was kind of scary to go out of sight of land that long. They were good at dealing with storms. You guys know of a famous storm in the Mediterranean. Pink? What? Pink? What is pink? Does anyone know? No. Um, uh, in, the book of, in the book of that, Acts, that, so crazy. in the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul was traveling through the Mediterranean, remember? And they left the Holy Land and they got to Crete. And Paul said, uh, you better stay in Crete because the weather, it's winter is coming. The weather's going to get bad. And the, the, the captain's like, oh, I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just go around the backside of the island. No, and they got taken by storm, shipwrecked on the island of Malta. It's all in the book of Acts. The, the Mediterranean, well, the story of Odysseus, right? Storms push you around all over the Mediterranean. But they were good sailors but they never really wanted to be out of sight of land for very long. Yeah, go ahead, Jay. The youngest person? Is their name is Pink? It's not the singer no, Pink? The oh, oh, the sailor. Okay. I thought that's not a name for a person. I did not know that. That's very interesting. No, I mean, how, really how, old, how old was this person? Was about That's very cool. Did this happen very long ago? Uh, sailed around, youngest person to sail around the world. 
Well, now you've got something to shoot for. Maybe one who can set the new record. And you better hurry because, you know, you only have a few years. Um, it's too late for me. Um, well, too late for me. Uh, so I, this is the first question I asked you. What three new developments made increased voyages of discovery possible? Nathan, give us one. Here. That's okay. So better boats. So boats that can carry more supplies. Remember, if I'm only a few days out of sight of land in the Mediterranean, I'm going to get food and water easy. By the way, why do we need to put water on the boat? Or, am I not sailing on water? I d yeah, but why can't I just drink that? Isn't it water? Okay. Yes, salt water will kill you. Not little bits. Don't, if your mother wants you to gargle with salt water, she's not trying to kill you or anything. But if you, if you live on salt water for a while, it will make you violently ill and eventually it will be fatal. Uh, like Oren said, it throws off your electrolytes, it throws off all of the, your chemical balance in your body, that too much salt, and it will be fatal. So, so you got to take water that you can drink. You got to take food. And so if you're going to be gone for a while, you need a ship that can accommodate that, right? And little ships that you only fill for a couple, like three, four days of provisions, because you're going to get to land again, you, that's not going to work if you want to travel long distances. Yeah, exactly. Sailor food rations, indeed, that goes along with ships. I, it never was because they never went very far from land. You see what I mean? Like if I know that within less than a week, I'm going to hit land again, I don't really need supplies for more than a week. Maybe I'll put in 10 days worth or something, you know, just to be on the safe side. What about any, like, uh, regulations? Like, no, they, they, the problem with food for sailing you have to have something that will keep. So it was notoriously not very good food. Salted meat, salted pork, salted to keep it. You know, it kind of does, except then after two months, after two months every day, maybe not so much. Um, and then hardtack. So bread that's really, it won't mold, right? Made in such a way so it's not very moist and it won't mold on you, but it does get wormy. A lot of sailors talk about it getting old. Yeah, yeah, his tooth yeah, broke that's, off. That's what I'm um, <laughs> uh, so, so better ships and capacity for provisions. Did anyone notice another thing that was developed in the Dorothy Mills reading? Something else? You got another one? Oh, sorry. Hansi, you can get the last one. Um, so, what does a compass do? Yes, which is close enough. Close enough for our purposes. It tells you the directions, right? If I'm going to go sailing all over the place, I'd kind of like to know maybe which direction I'm going. And am I going in circles? Please, I don't want to go in circles for months and months. I need to know, am I headed due east? Why not just look at the sun? Doesn't the sun rise in the east and set in the west? What if it's night? Okay, what if it's night? And... What other times do we not see the sun? In an eclipse. In an eclipse, or what's more common? Well, night. Storms. Storms, when it's cloudy. Then I can't tell. Also, have you guys ever noticed? Um, so this is me at my home. I'm facing east, all right? I have a window that faces east. And I'm getting up, and the sun is rising. Great. And if you do this every morning for six months, you will notice something. You will notice that in the summer, the sun is rising right about here, but in December, it's rising over here. Mm -hmm. And if I thought that the exact point was perfect east, wherever I see the sun, I wouldn't be right. And of course, we know that if I'm only going a mile and I'm off a little bit, I won't go too far off. If I'm going a thousand miles and I'm off a little bit, like by the end, I'm going to be way, way off course. So just depending on, oh, the sun rises in the east. Mm. Sometimes in the in the southeast. Sometimes, you know, a little closer to due east. So it's not it's not as reliable if you're going to go a long way. Yeah, Warren. Unless you're in Alaska, in which case it rises in the east and sets in the east. Yes, I know. I I used to live in Alaska, and I've witnessed the the sun that hovers on the horizon but never quite goes quite goes down. It's very weird. And then the winter when it just 
won't come up. It was, it was up, well, I lived in southern Alaska, so it was light from about 10 to 2 in the winter. Came up about 10 a.m., went down about 2 in the winter. It was, yeah, there was four hours of sun, maybe. So I usually took a flashlight with me to school because I went to school in the dark and I came home in the dark. Anyway, okay. And there's street lights, though. Okay. So, Hans, did you have another one? It was a little vague. New nautical instruments. Zach. Okay. Oh, well, that's not really, well, that, okay, that is a new development, isn't it? I should, so, yeah, yeah, I don't know that it's going to encourage people to travel. Perhaps it's going to scare them if they think there's going to be punishment. You mean punishment like on board the ship? Yeah, like you steal something, so. Or, or they put you on the ship as punishment? No, no, no. On the ship, if you feel like oh, I see. I see. Now, I don't. I don't feel like that would encourage me. I feel like that would make me want to stay home, or just don't steal things. You know. So Hans said new instruments. For example, astrolabes. Astrolabes <clears throat> measure. Okay. Now I'm an astrolabe. All right. This is the. It has a, a a bottom, a base, and it has an adjustable arm, and you sight the north star. This only works if you're in the northern hemisphere. Yeah. And and then what does this tell you? What does it does not tell you what time it is. It tells you what, Nathan? It doesn't tell you you're going north. The compass will do that. But if I see, okay, that hook on the wall over there is the North Star. So here I've got my astrolabe set up and I'm sighting on the North Star. This angle tells me something. The number of degrees, if you measure this angle, it tells me something. What does it tell me, Oren? It doesn't move. All the rest of the constellations move around like that. It's also bright. Anyway, I will tell you what it. I will tell you what it tells me. It tells me how far north of the equator I am. If you go out tonight and you find the North Star by the help of online resources or a book, you will find that the North Star is roughly that high. I don't know if that's perfect. So this would be like a 90 degree angle, right? From the horizon. This would be a zero degree angle. North Star is right about this. We are about 45 degrees latitude. We're about 45 degrees north of the equator. If, if you are on the equator, the North Star is down there. If you're at the North Pole, the North Star is up there. So, so they could measure. And of course, what do I need to know? I want to know what direction I'm going. I want to know how far north I am of the equator, so I can, you know, position myself as I navigate because I'm not seeing land. I'm not seeing land for a really long time. And I need to know how fast I'm going. And so they used math for this. You know, so this is my boat. This table is my boat. You toss a rope with knots, you toss a log, whatever, and your boat sails. So, ooh, I've tossed it and it's floating there, but the boat is sailing. And then suddenly it's at the end. I know how long my boat is. I know how I time it. I know how long it took to go from this end to this end. I can figure out how many, how many knots I'm going, how many miles an hour basically I'm going. So I know which direction I'm going, where I am in relation to the equator, and how fast I'm going. And then I can chart my path. Nathan. Uh, who's the guy that made the uh, table? I do not know. That's, That's pretty cool, isn't it? Xander, do you think you have a? Something to say? Um, okay, so the Portuguese. Let's start with them because without the Portuguese, this, this wouldn't have been possible. So Portugal, okay, I gotta come around. I'm gonna point to it and then I'm gonna get behind the map. Portugal is right here. Do you see the orange place next to Spain? Okay, Portugal. What about Portugal would make it likely that people there would wanna go sailing? Yes, Nathan. Because uh, next to the ocean, it's got huge coastline. The Portuguese said, you know what? We want in on the spice trade to India. We, you know, the Spanish go there. And we all used to go there. Venice used to go there. But they used to cut. Oh, I can't do it. Um, okay, we're just going to. Yeah, we're just going to do this. Okay. I need, you know what I need? Like 
like a a pointer. Yeah. Um, here, let me come on this side. I should brought a pointer. No, thank you. Um, I thought about that. Okay, so they used to be sailing. Okay, here's India, right? We just go to this side of the Mediterranean. We cut through, you know, we portage or whatever, and then we sail out of the Red Sea and we go to India. Yay, easy peasy. But why weren't they doing that anymore? Who's who's there? Zach, do you know? The Muslims are there. Oh, it's okay. The, the, the Muslims have taken over this whole area, and they're not really keen on people coming through. It's okay, then you can't see it. I mean, I already know. Okay, okay. So, so we're going to have to... There's got to be something wrong. Hey. What's that thing sticking up on that shelf over there? Does everybody see that thing? Is it like a ping pong bat? That, no, up at the top, on the on the on the top of the shelf. No, the, look at that thing sticking out. What is that? Oh no, I don't want to use that. Well, you know what? Bring it here. Bring it here, Xander. We improvise here. We're good. We're good. Okay. Got, oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm in Portugal and I want to get to India and I can't go this way. So I thought, okay, we're going to need to see how far south we have to go to get on Africa. We don't know because right across here is what? Desert. Desert. The Sahara Desert. We know all of this. We've known this for thousands of years, but we don't know what's below that because nobody travels it because you die. And so in Portugal, there was a guy, did I, what's the next question I asked you? I can't, see, now I can't see my book. Okay, here we go, okay. Um, oh no, no, I didn't ask it. Um, in Portugal, here, my arm's getting tired, I'm just gonna take a break. There was a, there was a prince, his dad was the king of Portugal, and he was named Henry, another Henry. And he decided to devote his life to making a um, sort of like a science lab, like a travel science lab. And he set up, I think it was on the coast or it was on an island off the coast of Portugal. He set up a, um, a school of navigation. And we know him as Prince Henry the Navigator. And Prince Henry um, hired ship captains and he said, here's the deal. I'm going to pay for your voyages. I want you to take huge amounts of notes. I want you to write down everywhere you go. I want you to time everything. I want you to use the instruments to take sightings. Make maps. I want to know what the coast of Africa looks like. So, you know, so they're going down the coast of Africa and reporting and reporting. And of course, it kind of freaks them out when they get here. Because suddenly the land, like, oh, oh, yay, we found the bottom. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. Big fat disappointment when you get here. But they're going, they're going, and going. And finally, and this is the second half of what motivated the Portuguese to sail to India. Who was the first guy to make it around? Uh, Not around Africa. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Vasco da Gama, da Gama. Um, I'm probably not saying his name in a very good Portuguese way, but it's all right. He made it around and set up bases. The Portuguese had bases on um, the east coast of Africa, up here, all the way to India, in what's today Calcutta. Um, and they're going back and forth, happy as clams, getting spices and bringing them back. Why does everybody... Have you asked? Did you talk to an unhappy claim? Yes. I suspect your report. Um, well, I have eaten a fair share of clams myself. Um, <laughs> it would. It would. Um, so, so here's the thing. Columbus knows all about this. And he has the idea that we all know right? Why don't we just sail the other direction? Why don't, why don't we just go this way and then come in on this side and we'll be there? We can, they did not. 
That is, that is a, an egregious lie. Anybody who had any sort of moderate education knew the world was round. The Greeks proved it. Everybody knew the world was round. I don't know how that rumor got started that everybody thought the world was flat. It's just not true. Everybody knew the world was round. That wasn't even an issue. It was just obvious. The problem, Oren, is not the flat world. It's the fact that Columbus was using a map. Not, he was using, hey, Jaden. He was using calculations not made by the Greeks who calculated the circumference of the earth very close to what it actually is. He was using someone else's calculations who thought the earth was much smaller. He thought it was much less around the world than it really was. If he had listened to the Greeks, he would have been okay. So he thought, you know, it's not that far. It's really not that far. We'll go that way. And of course, as you know the story, he hounded Ferdinand and Isabella. And finally, Isabella said, do it. Do it. And this started voyages um, west. Um, and they ran into a little snag. It would be called North and South America was the little snag. Um, but so why do they, just real quick, why do they want these spices so bad? Like, why are we going to risk our lives to get spices? OK, you can make a lot of money. But things are only valuable if people want to buy them from you. Why do people want to buy them? Because they taste good. And, and what, are people all gluttons in the Middle Ages? They, they, preserve they do preserve things. They preserve things at a time when people had no fridges. Um, people ate stuff that we would throw away. I'm just saying. You know, if you read, oh, like old stories like the Robin Hood and his Merry Men. They're always doing stuff like, oh, we've been out hunting. You know, we've been out traveling all morning. Oh, let's stop and have lunch. I'm just going to take this big slab of raw meat out of my bag and plop it on a fire. What? You've been carrying that around? Oh, that's gross. What is? But they're, they're eating it. That's fine. We'll just cook it. <laughs> well, porridge at least won't, you know, hopefully go bad and kill you. But meat, you know, like I would just throw it out. But they're like, no, just put some spices on it. It'll be okay. All right. Well, my husband would. My husband leaves pizza out, you know, in the car overnight at a hotel. And then he goes, I'm eating the pizza. I'm like, no, I'm not touching that pizza. It's been in the, well, it'll be fine. And he never gets sick. Anyway, so spices were, as, as Asher said, spices are very valuable. People want them. If I get in on the spice trade, I can make a lot of money selling spices to people. So the Portuguese get in on that. The Spanish, um, once Columbus had sailed for them, uh, it really, really changed everything. Oh, I, you know what? I need to talk about the next before we move away from Africa. They finally made it around the tip of Africa. And no, I just, I can see through the map a little bit and I could reach that. Um, and what was the original name of the tip of Africa, the Cape of Good Hope? What did they call it? Cape of Storms. Cape of Storms. Because, for obvious reasons, it's really stormy there. Also the tip of South America, it tends to be very stormy. And, you know, why, why do you think they changed it? Why not just call it Cape of Storms? What do you... What do you think, Nathan? Because it held great promise for history. It held great promise, but can you think of another reason? No one wants to go sailing in a place that's called Cape of Storms. Hey, everybody! I'm getting a crew together. You want to go sail to the Cape of Storms? No. Hey! It sounds creepy. Hey, you want to sail to the Cape of Good Hope? Yeah. Yeah. Where do I sign? So I think all of those reasons probably go together that nobody wants to call it. Cape of Storms. Okay, so that that song, everybody knows now how far South Africa goes, how to go around if they know the coastline and everything. Now the Spanish through Columbus have discovered this mess over here of a bunch of land that's in their way, keeping them from India. Um, how did that new world get the name America? All right, I'm going to let somebody, okay, Jaden, do it. Vespucci, very good. What did do you remember what he did? How did his name get associated? That's okay. That's okay. Hans. 
that his entire request up for uh, the new world, and he, he didn't know what like the main thing, so he just gave the main thing. Yeah. I think he just put his name on what he was printing, and other people saw it's like, oh, uh, Amer Amerigo, Amerigo, okay, well, it was called that America. So, you know, it could have been Columbia. There, there are lots of Columbuses and Columbias, you know, towns. Um, but, uh, but it got America by, a, by an accident of history. We call it America because this guy who didn't really, this is his only claim to fame. Like he printed some maps and information and put his name on it and yay, now it's your name for a whole two continents. You get to name it. Um, all right, so I gave you a list of explorers. Let's try to, don't, don't shout it out. Raise your hand to give people a turn. All right. Uh, all right, I need to be on this side with my handle. Ponce de Leon. Nathan, I'll give you the next one. Florida, Florida. And specifically, do you remember what he was looking for? Those were both really cool answers, but no. <laughs> gold was a guy I didn't ask about, Coronado. Coronado's running around over here looking for the golden city of El Dorado. Yeah, California, that was where the gold was. It was. They didn't know that till later. They nerd, found it. Uh, That's all right to be a nerd about. Um, what does anybody have a guess what they thought was in Florida? And it's kind of ironic. They thought that the fountain of youth, there was a fountain of youth in Florida. And if you drank from it, it would make you young. And here's what's ironic. Where do the old people move now? They all moved to Florida. I find this ironic. There is no fountain of youth, but the old people still move there. Yeah. Mostly because of the weather, but yes. Oh, no, <laughs> presumably longer. All right, oh, Clara, one. you wanted that one, but you want to give me Cortez? Where did Cortez go? Mexico, Mexico. So Cortez, um, it brought armies to Mexico. I'm sorry, this is a very, like we're not doing justice to any of these events, but this is the amount of time we have to talk about it. Um, the Aztecs were living in Mexico. And um, I need to just put this down for a little bit, except I'm attached to it. Um, to rest my arm. Um, the Aztecs were not very nice. And that's putting it nicely. They ripped people's hearts out on altars and it was an ugly thing. And um, they had heard rumors that some god was going to travel, you know, uh, a, on a winged vessel. And, they, and the sails looked like wings to them. Um, I think it's been oversold, this idea that, oh, they thought the gods were arriving. But the more important thing was the Aztecs had conquered all the neighboring peoples, and they were not nice to them. They enslaved them. They sacrificed them. And so the minute Cortez and his soldiers landed, all these people, the Aztecs, came running to them. It's like, please, 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 please save us from the Aztecs about the Aztecs. They were on board. I don't think Cortez could have beat them if he hadn't had a boatload of help from other natives who hated the Aztecs. Um, so the Spanish took over um, much of Central America. Yes, I need my map again. No. Oh, no. They, they didn't even really know how many and what kind of people they were going to find. This keeps getting, this part that's broken keeps getting caught. Okay, so um, here I need to point this out. You might think that the Portuguese were just super happy. Like, oh, yay, we go this way, the Spanish go that way, and they lived happily ever after. No, the Portuguese said, wait a minute, we want to come over here too. We, we, would, we would like to explore, we would like part of this too. And so they started setting up settlements in Brazil. And then the Spanish said, whoa, this is ours. And Portuguese said, says who? Says you. So the person who was going to say is going to be the Pope. They consulted the Pope and they said, okay, who gets what? 
And the Pope said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to pick a longitude line. And we're just going to run a longitude line along here. And everything on this side is going to be Portuguese. And everything on that side is going to be Spanish. Yay. So let's run the line right about here. Of course, they hadn't explored much of this yet. So the Spanish get all of this. And the Portuguese get Brazil. The Portuguese are like, what? That was a raw, raw deal. But of course, they did have all the trading posts and stuff going the other way. So maybe it's OK. This is why people in, in Brazil speak Portuguese. You know, many South America and Central American countries speak Spanish. In Brazil, they speak Portuguese. They were a Portuguese colony, not a Spanish colony. Yes, sir. Oh, why? Why? is very icy. It's not green at all. It's like the same reason nothing happens in Antarctica. It's just. Why is it cold though? Because it's very close to the North Pole. It's very. So look how far north it is. I mean, like even with northern Canada and Alaska. So it's the same. Antarctica is not unknown. And Greenland isn't unknown. It's just there's just no point. Yes. There's just nothing happening there. There's not very many settlements, even like the Eskimo groups. There were Eskimo groups in Greenland, but even then it's it's very harsh and there weren't lots of big settlements What's there ever. The yeah, it lo looks like Russia to me. Okay. Okay, go Wait. ahead. Back to our thing. Um, Sorry, Nathan. Also, also, yeah. Yes. Greenland no, Greenland's, Greenland is not near that big. The, Nathan makes a good point. Uh, projection maps like this look different than if you look on a globe, the sizes of things, because it's like peeling an orange and then trying to spread the peel out flat. The parts at the top and the bottom of the orange are going to not be joined anymore. You know, you can't peel a ball and then mush its skin flat without breaking the top and the bottom and making it look a little weird. Okay, back, back to court. Oh, we did Spanish and Portuguese. OK. Um, De Soto, where is he? Juliana. Oh, OK. Juliana gets the next one. Juliana gets the next one. Mississippi River, um, which is, I mean, you guys know where the Mississippi River is, pretty far in. Um, what they did was found the source. They traveled through the Gulf of Mexico to where it empties into the Gulf of Mexico. OK. Juliana. Balboa. Darien. Um, it was the peak. It was a mountain. Do you remember what he could see from the peak? The Pacific Ocean. So we get here, we being the Spanish and the Portuguese. We get here, and we're exploring, we're exploring, we're exploring. And then somebody gets the bright idea. I'm just going to see how far this strip of land goes to the west. And they cross it, and they look, and like, holy cow, there's another one. There's another ocean. Because they were hoping, oh, maybe we can see China and India from here. Oh, no. You cannot. It's very, very, very far away. So she discovered the fact that there was another ocean on the other side. Um, there's a famous poem. Oh, I should have brought the poem. Um, it's talking about a guy, the first time he ever read a particular translation of the Iliad by Homer. And he said, it was like I was um, standing on that peak and Darien looking out on the Pacific Ocean, like I discovered a new world. Except in the poem, he doesn't say hey, Balboa. He says the wrong explorer. It's OK. We forgive him. It's an awesome poem anyway. Um, OK, next up, Pizarro. What did Pizarro find? And where was he exploring? What is it, Zach? OK. The Incas. So um, Peru, this, this um, west coast of South America. Um, my son got to go to Peru a few years ago with a biology trip. And they cataloged birds and lived out in the jungle. And it was very weird. For a month, they cataloged birds in Peru. Your children still get to do that. They do. They're very fun. Um, OK, last up. Cabot. He is the one who doesn't sort of seem like he fits into this list. Nathan. Didn't Cabot uh, explore the South America? 
he did the East Coast. Where specifically? Do you remember? What? Yes. Island. He's going a little up the St. Lawrence River. He's exploring what we call New England today. Um, and this, this is the island, Newfoundland. This is where I was born. I was born on that island, which is kind of another cool thing. I always have to tell people that because like you care where I was born, but it's interesting. Um, why is he different? Okay, Ponce de Leon, Cortez, De Soto, Balboa, Pizarro. What do they sound like? Where do they sound like they're from? So that was or Spain. So in this case, it's Spain. They're Spanish. Cabot. Who sent him? England. England. He wasn't actually English. He was. Uh, was he Italian? Was he French? Cabot. Oh, now I want to know. I can't remember. And Dorothy Mills tells us. I'm just going to drop that. John Cabot and his son Sebastian, two Venetians. They were Italian in the service of Henry VII. So England started thinking, well, we want some too. The Spanish have some and the Portuguese have some. What do we get? And so unfortunately, everything in Central and South America and this area was Spanish already. Brazil's Portuguese. So what's left? We're going to explore up here. And remember I told you there's, there's a sinking? suspicion in people's minds, which unfortunately isn't true, that maybe there's a way around this lump of land to the north, the Northwest Passage. And it's unfortunate because, look, I sail in this river. Oh, yay. I found the way through. No, you didn't. Go back out. Oh, yay. I mean, some, it, it, you keep finding. Oh, and then this freezes in the winter. I go up here and I start trying to sail. Yeah, no, it's going to be ice. You're going to die. Your ship's going to get stuck in the ice overnight. You're all going to die. So we never did. There's not really a good way to sail around. We didn't know that. So they kept exploring and exploring and exploring. So like this is why a lot of these places have British names, except for Quebec, where they still speak French. Because the French started sending people over to explore, too, eventually. They would like a piece of the action as well. Yeah, Nathan. Nathan. Yes, yes, because going all the way around South America, which we'll move on to that, is a long trip. Now, let's talk about that trip. What did Magellan's expedition accomplish, and why did he not help accomplish it? Um, okay, I'm a, Zach and Nathan. Nathan, tell me what he did, and then you tell me why he didn't. Why he didn't. What cape? He, yes, both of them, but what what did he actually, how would we sum up what he did? He, okay, I'm going to give it to Zach, and then Oren, you tell me why he didn't finish it. Zach, you just tell me what his expedition did. His crew sailed around the world. Sailed around the world. Oren, why didn't he sail around the world? He, he got killed in the Philippines. So they left, Magellan's expedition left Europe, and they went this way. We sailed across the Atlantic, but by this time, people had done this a lot of times, you know, gone back and forth across the Atlantic, no big deal. And they start working their way south, just like they worked their way down Africa. We got to work our way down South America. We don't know how far south it goes. And, and they would stop, you know, take a look at the bottom of South America, the south end. Look how close it is to Antarctica. Do you ever think about the fact that South America gets really, really cold in the winter? Like penguins swim over, and there are penguins sometimes in the southern tip of South America. It's cold there. They're close to Antarctica. So there were times when they couldn't sail because of weather, and they kept stopping and, and, and thinking, okay, are we going to find it? And, and then the poor guys, just second Asher, uh, they're sailing along. They're sailing down the coast. Oh, it's a river. Maybe this is the, the way through. Oh, no, it's not. Go about the river. Oh, oh, it's another river. Let's go. No, no, it's not. And they're going in every river, hoping the river will widen out and it'll be the way through. Never is. Two of his ships say, two or three of them. He had five ships, by the way. I'm done. They just left. 
They just left him and they went back to Europe. Like, we're not going to find the way around. There is no way around. We're done. So we lost two or three ships. Okay, Asher, chime in. Yes, but when it's um, summer here, then it's winter there. Well, it's not technically winter now. Yes, yeah, so weirdly for them, it's fall. It's weird. The earth is weird. Okay, so Magellan um, tries to keep the rest of his crew together, the two or three ships that are left to him, and they keep going. I should have brought this book in. I have this book that has the journals they kept, some of the letters that they wrote, and they said, oh, we landed in this one place, and there were giant people with big feet. And they called them the Patagonians. Like it meant they, had, they were giant people with big feet. And it comes to find out, people later visited, they didn't have big feet. What they did was, it's cold there. When it's cold, they wrapped their feet in skins of animals, like they made homemade boots. But you know what it would look like if you just took skins and wrapped your feet in them and tied thongs around it to hold it on? Like it would look like you had enormous feet. Like my feet aren't this big even. You know what I mean? If you So they're clomping around on these things and Magellan's guys are like, oh my gosh, they're like monsters with huge feet. No, they're not. They just wrap their feet up. It's called boot. Um, so they finally made it around, but they sailed to, oh, now I got to get on the other side. I got to switch hands. They sailed around. They sailed around South America, across the Pacific, till they got to the Philippines. Oh, sorry. So they got to the Philippines. <laughs> You're right. Um, it is kind of, you know, a long string of... Yeah, it's right. Okay. So, so they got to the Philippines, and the problem in the Philippines was this. There were various tribes living in the Philippines and they were fighting each other and they were in a war and they said, hey, Mr. Magellan and your crew, would you like to join our side of the war? And the answer, the correct answer would have been no, but like, sure, sure, I'll fight. And then he got killed in battle. At this point, they're only down to one ship. I don't remember what happened to the, I think, I don't know if it got shipwrecked. I don't remember, but they're down to one ship and it was called the Victoria, which is nice because it means victory. And they finished the trip, which means, remember, that they went all the way from, not Japan, from the Philippines, around Africa and back to Europe. They sailed around the world. It took them three years. And it was just a handful of guys, like less, 25 or less guys. I can't remember the exact number. Out of the whole crew, made it back. Because they died. Oh, well, some of them died in the battle. Some of them went home. Some of them got ill. Are you familiar with scurvy? Do you, what is scurvy? Do you know? Here, would somebody put this back up there for me? Um, scurvy happens when you don't have vitamin C. Um, and one thing that doesn't keep very well is fruit. Fresh fruit. You can't get oranges just anywhere. I mean, we can. Like, yeah. you go to any hive. But with the old people looking for the fountain of youth and oranges. Um, now, we can get them anywhere, but, you know, oranges don't grow everywhere and they don't keep forever. So sailors notoriously didn't get fruit and they didn't get enough vitamin C. It's nasty, guys. It makes your teeth fall out, makes your gums bleed what and does? you're scurvy and your teeth fall out and it kills you eventually. It no, it's a Why disease. It scurvy is a disease. It tastes like cherries. Yeah, that's right. It's when you don't get enough vitamin C. So they, they did not know for a while why sailors got so sick. And then they, they did research, you know, and they discovered, oh, my gosh, they need oranges. They need limes. That's why British soldiers, maybe don't know this, or sailors, were sometimes called limeys. A limey is the name for a British sailor. Why? Because they carried limes with them. Limes, because limes have vitamin C, um, so they didn't get scurvy. So Magellan's got, Magellan didn't make it, but Magellan's name gets attached to it, even though he got killed. We still call it Mag Magellan sailed around the world, but he didn't. He got killed in the Philippines. But his guys did. Um, but unfortunately, we don't know their names. Like That's just the injustice of history. They did make it, and I don't know their names, but I know Magellan, but he didn't make it. Um, 
So people realize just how big around the world is now that I can sail basically east or west, you know, if I want to get to a certain point. It really is better to do what the Portuguese were doing, you know, sailing around Africa and going to India. It's never going to be practical to sail west and get to India. Nobody wants to go all the way around South America and all the way across the Pacific Ocean just to get to India. Why would I do that? I can just go around Africa um, until we get the Panama Canal, right? Still, still shorter to go the other way. But the Panama Canal cuts a great deal of the travel off. Um, and so reports of this are coming back, coming back, flooding back to Europe every time they find a new group of people. And people are just astounded. Oh, my gosh, I didn't know any of this was there. Um, Australia, Australia um, eventually, yes. Um, so I'm going to, well, no, I'm not. I, there's a speech I give, but I'm not going to give it. I do not know. Like, I thought that when they got there, they moved around the ring and they found like, a couple of lakes. And so they thought the entire middle was just an ocean. You know what? I don't know. I'll tell you guys. I know almost zero. There are kangaroos in Australia and very large spiders. This is probably pretty much what I know about Australia. And platypuses, right? Oh, yes. And they're like, there's big. Yeah, and in Peru. That's why my, my son is in Peru. I'm like, no, I'm never going to Peru. Anyway. I do, I do not know what is in. I know something about New Zealand now because of my daughter. But um, All right. That is our very last tour of the Age of Exploration. It does not do it justice at all. Every single one of these guys has an amazing stories. So if you're into that, I mean, I even book, I have books at home. You can borrow from me if you want to just read more about the explorers. I will bring them for you and lend them to you. Um, but we are going to move on. Um, do you guys know we only have six weeks left? We have six classes left. Like, what? So we, uh -huh. we, are you moving? Oh, I thought you don't love us anymore, Zach. Oh, well, that's, that's the breaks. Sometimes people just, where, where, where are you moving to, Zach? Kansas City? My daughter ballet danced for a month in Kansas City once. Okay. All right. Come back to me. Anyway. Come back to me. Yes. No, it's all right. I I encouraged it by asking. Okay, one more Why comment. Get out in this room. What? I like no. Cheese. We are going to live we are going to live together peacefully despite our sports interests. Okay. So, the book we are reading is called Renaissance and Reformation Times. We've looked at a lot of art. We've talked about the changes in learning. We haven't talked very much about the Reformation. We talked a little bit about Henry VIII saying we're going to have our own church, but we haven't really talked about the, the Reformation as a whole. So in the six weeks we have left, we're going to be talking part of it about that and then the rest of it about Queen Elizabeth, uh, her time in England and Shakespeare and things like that. So next week, I'm going to ask you to read a little bit more than sometimes. It's like 23, 25 pages or something in here. It's the next three chapters, chapters 11 through 13, because they all go together, right? They're all about the Reformation and important reformers in several countries that were all working at the same time. So it's really not that much, but just know if you, are, if you have a bad habit of eating it all on Tuesday or something before you come, and I don't recommend that habit at all, you don't want to do that this week, all right? You want to spread it out a little bit. Answer the questions. Um, and so we got, I don't know, a little over half an hour. Um, please get out an empty piece of paper. You're like, you've got one already. If It can be in your reading guide. Just something you can write on. We are probably, this. I'm saying this to encourage you, if, if you need encouragement of this sort. Since we only have about six weeks left, we're probably only going to do a couple more papers. So make them the best papers you've ever done in your life. Make them amazing. Um, here, and, and we've done several of these five-paragraph persuasive essays. You know, we've done the same thing. We're going to mix it up a little bit. We're going to do something slightly different. We are not.
because I am benevolent. I am merciful. Um, here's what I want you to write down on your paper. I want you to put a Roman numeral two, a Roman numeral three, and a Roman numeral four. Now, you might say, does Mrs. Ferguson not know how to count? Does she not know that things start with one? She does. But that's going to be our introduction, and we're not going to work on that this week. You're not writing a paper this week. You're only making an outline. Okay? But I want to tell you what kind of paper this is going to be. We're still going to have five paragraphs. That's why you have three body paragraphs and an introduction and a conclusion. But we're going to talk about something else. You're not going to try to persuade me of a position this time. You're just going to discuss something. And here's what you're going to discuss. Write this down. I want you to choose two characters from Lord of the Rings, not just any. Oh, do you need a pencil? Okay. Anybody got a spare? Uh, toss it over. Just, just throw. Just, oh, no, just throw it. We're good. Yeah, just throw it. No, he's good. It won't put his eye out. You see, he's so good he even caught it. Okay. Now, can everybody, is everybody with me? Because this is probably the most, like organizing this paper this week is the most important part, so I want you to hear it. I want you to choose two characters that probably go together. I'm going to make some suggestions. For example, Aragorn and Boromir. They would be a good pair. They're both men. Um, Legolas and Gimli, they're a good pair. I want you to choose two that are similar but not exactly the same. Do you know oh, what I mean? Wait, like, Frodo like, and... no. Um, Gandalf, who would I put with Gandalf, do you think? Um, who would be his counterpart? Uh, Bilbo. Bilbo. Uh, Saruman? Saruman. Saruman. What? Another to talk about. They're exactly the same. So you need to choose a pair that you can come. Yeah. Listen, you need to choose a, a pair that you can compare, but that you can contrast. Do you see what I mean? A pair that you can find samenesses and differences. And I don't think you're going to find any differences between Mary and Pippin. You're not going to find any samenesses between Gandalf and Frodo. Do you know what I mean? They're just completely different characters. Okay, go ahead, Zach. What are we going to say? Let's not. Um, but like, who are you going to compare to? Like Sauron, Morgoth and Sauron. Um, I suppose. I mean, that's not really. He's 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 from another book we're not reading. He's basically Satan. Oh oh, well, Melkor and Morgoth are the same character, aren't they? That they're different names for the same character. Yeah. He's called Melkor and Morgoth. Um, okay, I guess I would let you do that. I mean, Sarah, I can. My my daughter's super duper Tolkieny, and she would. But but these are these are some suggestions. Listen, I'm not saying you have to choose one of these pairs. If you can think of another pair, like Elrond and Galadriel, they're. But again, they're very similar. It might be hard to contrast them. Yeah, Orin. Sure. We don't know. Hey, Oren. Oren, shh. We don't really know very much about Sauron from this book. Um, so it might be true. Why don't you let me tell you what you're going to... Hey, guys, I need you to listen to me. We have like less than half an hour. And I wanted to talk about the books and everything. So I really have to do this. Um, second. No, I lost my train of thought. Just a second. What did you say, Oren? You said you said Sar Sauron and Saruman. Was that the last thing you said? Somebody yeah, said something and it took me. Like, oh, okay. I'm back. My train is back. So maybe if I explain to you what you're going to do in these paragraphs, it will help you see what kind of characters to choose. Okay? In this paragraph, I want you to write this down. I want you to choose one character. You know, you've cho you've picked two. Choose one of them for this paragraph. And I want you to um, 
just describe the character. I want you to say at least three things about them. And you might say, I don't know how to describe a character. You're in luck. I've given you something in your reading guide to help you. Write that down and then turn in your reading guide to page 73. And it says, response to literature analysis topics, page 73. I'm going to wait till everybody finds it. That's okay. Do you want me to come over and stand next to you so you can see what I'm talking about? Okay, okay. So you can find it again and you can see what I mean. At the very top, under the main title, it says, analysis topic main character. Does everybody see that? Analysis topic, main character. And then I'm going to read what it says. It says, detail options, choose one or two. Qualities. Choose from the list of character qualities on page 164. Okay, it's not on page 164 for you. It's on the next page. On the back of that page, it says character qualities. Oh, my goodness. And we have Thoroughness, thriftiness, loyalty, obedience, gratitude, honor, discernment, dependability, creativity, endurance, disorderliness, indulgence. This is not an exhaustive list. This is just examples. This character shows initiative. This character shows self-control. You see? So that's one thing you can talk about. And just don't, don't just tell me. Aragorn showed self-control. Prove it. Prove it. Tell me where in the book he did that. Throw a quote in if you want to, but at least give me an example. Don't just tell me something. Or he Prove did it. Or he, or who? Well, I just threw oh, Aragorn. Aragorn when died. He didn't tell his secret, did he? Yeah. He showed self control. He was. So, okay, back, go back to the literature analysis topics. So just keep in mind, you've got all those character qualities there. Another thing, it says motive. What did the character do and why did he do it? Effect. What was the character's effect on the situation or others or himself? How did this character change? Why did he change? What did this character learn? How did he learn? These are things you can talk about. Remember what it says above? Choose one or two. You don't have to talk about all of those. And some of them might not even apply to your character that you chose, right? I just want you to tell me a little bit about this character. What is he like? What did he do? Did he change? Did he affect other people? Do, does that make sense to everybody? By asking yourself these questions. This week, I want you to ask yourself those questions and then write down several points about that character that you would like to discuss. Then I want you to do the same thing for the other character. Now, say in this character, I decided to discuss his qualities and his motive. Do I have to do qualities and motive here? No, I don't. Maybe for this character, I want to talk about what his effect on the situation was and how he changed. I don't have to talk about the same things. But just think about everything you know about this character. What's he done? What's he said? What's he been like? Has he been nasty? Has he been good? Has he been helpful? Has he been a problem? And, and tell me about it. And then in this paragraph, we're going to compare and contrast them. I would like you to think of at least three ways that they are alike or different and how they show that. And they don't have to be all three alikes or all three differences. You can mix it up. Like in one way, Aragorn and Boromir are very similar because they're both men. They're both from the race of men. And they are both in charge of men, right? They're leaders. Yet, Aragorn is much older. He's from the Numenorean race, and he's got ties to the ring 
and to the elves that go way beyond Boromir's. You see what I did? I just compared and contrasted them. I said, in one way, they're alike. In another way, they're different. Aragorn was faithful to the quest of the ring. Boromir had a, a meltdown and caused a problem, but he came around in the end. Do you, you see what I'm doing? Does that make sense to everybody? All right, here's what you're gonna do. I want you to bring your outline next week. Bring it and just have chosen two characters, have told me some things about one, things about the other, and at least three ways they're the same or different. And I want to look at it. And then, you know, the next week after that is our break. So you're gonna end up having two weeks after that to write the paper. So this is gonna be kind of a slow paper, but I don't want you to try to write it in one week. So we're just gonna do it this way, okay? And I'll tell you about the introduction and the conclusion next week. So I want if, if you have that, and if and I just want to make sure everybody understands what I'm driving at. Is there any questions at all? Okay. If you're trying to work on it this week and a question pops up, email me or call me and I'll put you on track, okay? This is this is a little bit different than what we've been doing. For the time we have left, I wanted to talk a little bit about Legolas and Gimli. You don't have to choose them as your pair, but I think they're really interesting. And here's why. Did they start out as friends? No. Oh my goodness. No, they didn't. So I brought in my Fellowship of the Ring. When they first met at the council, they were very suspicious of each other. Elves and dwarves don't get along very well. They're very different. They love different things. But as they're traveling, and this is when they're going through Moria, I want to read you a couple of, you know, conversations they have. Um, <clears throat> well, here we are at last, said Gandalf as they're approaching Moria. Here the elven way from Holland ended. Holly was the token of the people of that land, and they planted it here to mark the end of their domain. For the west door was made chiefly for their use, for the elves, in their traffic with the lords of Moria. Those were happier days when there was still close friendship at times between folk of different race, even between dwarves and elves. It was not the fault of the dwarves that the friendship ended, said Gimli. I've not heard it was the fault of the elves, said Legolas. It wasn't my fault. Well, it wasn't my fault. This is what their relationship is like. And then they say, um, here, I want to go back to that one. Here, just a second. There was another one. Okay. This is when they're in Lothorian. The voice of Legolas faltered. He was singing about Lothorian. And the song ceased. I cannot sing anymore, he said. That is but a part, for I have forgotten much. It is long and sad, for it tells how sorrow came upon Lothorian, Lorian of the Blossom, when the dwarves awakened evil in the mountains. But the dwarves did not make the evil, said Gimli. I said not so. Yet evil came answered Legolas sadly. They're blaming each other for the breakdown of the relationship between the dwarves and the elves, aren't they? Over and over. But they show little mm, mm, glimmers of the fact that they're very similar. They go into Moria, and how does Gimli feel about being in Moria? Oh, oh my gosh, this is the ancestral 